I've got wine and food and more wine and more food. Yum. This one might take a while. Sit back and relax. Hey everybody, it's Jeff. Welcome to another episode of Stay Rad Wine Blog TV. You know, um, I've been sitting on these bottles for a while and I'm kind of excited to jump into it. Uh, about a, a month or so ago, uh, I received this sample from my, uh, my buddies over at uh, Cornerstone Cellars and I was asking them, hey, can I just jump into these right now? And they were saying, look, just relax, just just wait till the time is right, let those bottles settle in, um, and, and then dive into them when you're ready. And so now is the time, right? I'm on Christmas vacation. My beard has not been this long in, in years. Um, you know, in a couple days we got uh, Christmas, in a couple days I'm gonna be a dad, so I mean, Things are going to be a little bit different, um, but I really just wanted to uh, spend some time with you guys and uh, spend some real quality time with these wines. Uh, I think what's exciting here is that for Cornerstone, and you guys have seen me review some of their other stuff, they do some stellar uh, Oregon Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but they got these amazing uh, Cabernets, Napa Valley Cabernets. And what I've got here is uh, two bottles. They're both from the year 2010. This is their Napa Valley uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. And then right here, I've got their 2010 Howl Mountain. Cabernet Sauvignon. And so what's going to be fun for me is looking at two wines and, and these are not, um, they're not cheapo wines. These aren't, uh, entry level wines in any sense of the word. Um, but when you talk about Napa Valley Cabernet, maybe they're bringing a little bit of value. We've got the, their Napa Valley Cab is $65. Their Howl Mountain Cab is $80. Um, but I'm excited to see how they stack up against your typical Napa Valley cab and against, you know, some of those upper echelon cabs and, and, and see if it really is worth it. My, my feeling has always been that they really do bring value and the wines that, that are at those higher price points from, from Cornerstone um, have always been rock solid. So here we've got these two wines from 2010, which was a relatively cool vintage. Um, and what I'm really excited about is this. L let me give you the breakdown for the Napa Valley Cabernet. It's 85% Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's harvested from all around the Napa Valley. So we've got some stuff coming from Rutherford, from the Oak Knoll District, from Oakville, and then some from Howe Mountain. Then we've got this Howe Mountain Cabernet, which is, uh, it's 90% Cabernet that's coming from Howe Mountain. Now, uh, their vineyard that they're sourcing from, from Howe Mountain, is the Ink Grade Vineyard. Howe Mountain is in the northeast, uh, northeastern corner of the Napa Valley, overlooking the Napa Valley, overlooking Rutherford. Um, but this vineyard is on the east side of this already eastern mountain. Um, so, you know, the, the site is a little bit more unique compared to what we're getting from the rest of Napa Valley and even from some of the uh, mountainous AVAs surrounding the Napa Valley. Um, this is, of course, going to be a whole lot uh, of a cooler climate when we talk about Howe Mountain. Um, but having that eastern exposure, you know, so you're going to get nice full sun for most of the day. You're going to lose it a little bit earlier from everybody else. Uh, so what you're going to see is a lot, a lot quicker of a, of a shift from these warmer days to these really cool nights. And because we are dealing with a place that this vineyard's about 1800 feet uh, up that mountain, it's, it's significantly cooler, um, significantly uh, it's going to have like a longer, typically a longer growing season because it's so cool. But that's going to allow it to really get a nice long firm acidity when we deal with these mountain ranges. Um, so what I'm interested in is the sense that we've got one wine that is almost all coming from the exact same vineyard, uh, from the exact same mountain range. And then we've got this other wine that has grapes from the exact same year with a nice small percentage coming from that, uh, 
coming from that vineyard, but also coming from all around the Napa Valley. So I would think of it, you know, this Napa Valley cab right here is more of like a, a, a winemaker's wine in the sense that you're the winemaker selecting all these grapes from all these different places around one of the greatest wine growing regions in the world. And then here we're just getting so much more specific where we're saying this is this one spot in this area and, and, and these grapes are, are, are very much, if this is a winemaker's wine, this is, this is a very much a terroir. Uh, driven wine. So it's all about the site. It's all about the soil. It's all about the climate. 2010, uh, an awesome year as far as I'm concerned. It's the year I got married. Um, I remember the summer of 2010 specifically being uh, much cooler uh, than your typic, uh, typical California summer, um, but there was a big blast of heat at the end of August that really did um, start to quicken some really slow ripening grapes at the end. Uh, but then it did still kind of taper off a little bit and, and maintained a, a relatively cool, relatively wet um, kind of 2010 summer. Um, so on top of you've got these mountain grapes right here that, that usually have a, a longer growing period in general, um, when you talk about a, a, a ridiculously cool summer in general, you're ex you're expecting an even longer uh, uh, range of, of when these grapes were growing, a, a, a lot longer of a hang time on there. Um, so I'm excited to get into these things. Let's uh, let's start with this Napa Valley, right? And and I am gonna pour these side by side, and, and hopefully I don't get them mixed up. So everybody, Napa Valley, right here. That's to your right, my left. I think, all right, and then we'll put Howl Mountain to my right, your left. You confused yet? Let's take a peek, right? So Howl Mountain over here, Napa Valley over here, 2010 Cornerstone Cellars, right? Um, so just looking at color-wise, what I'm seeing is, wow. So, I mean, they're both this, this typical, you know, dark ruby red that we're getting from Cabernet. I'm noticing on the, uh, on my screen right now is that this Howl Mountain over here, a little bit more red, a little bit lighter in color. We're getting a, a darker, inkier kind of play uh, with the Napa Valley over here. Now, let's check out these noses. And again, when I'm thinking about this Napa Valley one, um, you know, a relatively cool year, but because we have a lot of that valley floor fruit, um, we're thinking that it's going to be a lot more ripe, a lot more fruit forward as compared to, and, and my take before I even get into it, is that the Howl Mountain stuff is going to be, uh, have a little bit more of that acidity, a little bit more of um, these herbal type of notes, but of course we can, we can be very much surprised here. By the way, um, with that being said, uh, alcohol content for Napa Valley, 14.5, pretty high. Howl Mountain, I was expecting, if you just told me one was Napa Valley, one was Howl Mountain, I would expect Napa Valley to have higher alcohol, but here we go, Howl Mountain, 14.7. Um, in some circles, 14.5, 14.7, it's negligible. They're both ridiculously high in alcohol, but sometimes that's what you want, right? As long as, as, long as there's balance, right? And I think that's the key. Um, a lot of times we focus on, I was hearing a winemaker the other day in an interview saying that we never want to push 13.5 uh, for our wines. But you know, 13.5 with no balance can taste like crap. And 14.7 with mad balance can be excellent. So let's see. Uh, here's that Napa Valley. So on the nose, dark plum, dark currant cassis uh, type of fruit. I am getting a subtle influence of the oak. Um, oak treatment. Pretty much the same. With Napa Valley, it was 22 months in 65% new French oak. Uh, Howl Mountain, 22 months in 
75% new French oak, so I mean relatively similar, a little bit more oak on this one, um, but age length, both in the barrel and both in the bottle, right around the same, right? So on the nose again. I'm getting those dark fruits. Uh, I am getting just a little hit of like some cherry to go along with the uh, cassis and with the, uh, with the plum flavors there. I'm getting a little bit of that toasty vanilla oak, not over the top or in your face in anywhere. It's the, very much a, a secondary type of, of, of note um, that is really kind of rounding things out, right? It's weird because we kind of gone through these shifts where um, you see it more with Chardonnay, right? With white wine, um, you see how people are trying to get as far away from oak as possible sometimes. And, and I was listening to um, Jameson Fink's uh, podcast, and a great podcast, by the way, Jameson. Um, and he was talking about, you know, I like oak. And it's okay to have an oaky Chardonnay, so long as it's not, you know, overwhelming. And, and, and definitely when we talk about Cabernets, that oak is, is, is such an integral part of the flavor and about the, the composition of that wine, right? I am getting, uh, along with that vanilla type of play, it's a little creamy, a tad bit buttery, but again, kind of uh, in the background there. Getting a few like herbally, menthol-y, herbaceous type of notes on the nose as well. And on the palate, there's loads of these dark, brambly fruits. I'm getting blackberry. Uh, really ripe raspberry, plum, cassis. The tannins, um, very much present. This is very much an, an, an ageable type of wine. And, and so when you talk about those 65 bucks, what is it buying you? I, it's buying you a wine that is going to age quite gracefully. Um, and with that being said, the tannins here are, are, are though very present, um, they're very much soft and fine and approachable, um, even as, as such a young tyke as this guy is right now. Um, wow, well, let me get back into this. Jeremy, you're gonna love this. Very chalky, very chalky. Merry Christmas, my man. Um, yeah, and those herbaceous type of notes are coming back as well. I'm getting a little bit of like a, a black tea um, type of play. And wow, I hate to be the guy that says this. It's very much a, very much a smooth uh, wine that I think um, if you were trying to impress the ladies and you see this on a list, you might want to pick it up. It's, it's very nice, very nice. Um, let me get into the Howl Mountain and then I'll, I'll think about throwing down a score. But um, sneak preview, it's really good. Uh, so with the Howl Mountain, on the nose, definitely much more herbaceous, where I was first noticing dark fruits on the nose with this, um, and those herbal notes were like secondary and tertiary, tertiary type of notes. Um, as I get to the nose on the Howl Mountain, those herbal characteristics are right up front. And whereas I got some black tea on the palate here, I'm getting um, some, some black tea on the nose here. I'm getting <clears throat> And those fruits are there. I mean, I'm definitely getting um, those, those plum fruits, um, a little bit of like a, a red currant, like a little cassis on there, and, and maybe, gosh, as you talk about uh, the slightly brighter red color here, maybe think a little bit of more like a, some, some red type of fruits, but the fruit's definitely there. The fruit here, it's not the lead off man. It's kind of like the, uh, kind of like the cleanup hitter, right? It's, it's, it's letting those, uh, those other flavors kind of set the table, right? 
Yeah, black tea, menthol, tobacco. And you know, while there's more of that new French oak uh, that's on this wine, it's, it's much more deeply integrated um, with the rest of those herbal type of flavors. And again, the, the fruit, while present, kind of taking a back seat. Um, I am assuming that when I get onto the palate, this is going to be a lot more of a, a, a softer type of play. I mean, if the nose is any indication, I'm thinking of more of these herbal, leafy type of flavors on the palate, um, which I tend to enjoy in a cab. And I think sometimes, you know, here we go, Napa Valley, think bigger fruit. When we go up into Howe Mountain, I want you to think of that fruit, again, just kind of stepping back and letting all these other flavors come together, right? Powdery, silky, tannins, black pepper spice, and there's that menthol, and there's that tobacco, and there's this just hardcore, lingering acid for days. Days! It's still there, and my mouth is watering, and you know, it's, it's weird. Here I am, 16 minutes, 15 seconds, into uh, this episode right here, and maybe I should have told you from the beginning. Really, the plan is to take my time with these wines, and, you know, if you talk to the guys at Cornerstone, you know, on their website, um, what's really fun is when you look at their wines in their online store, a lot of times they talk about wine and food pairings. I've seen them put recipes on there. And, and I had a few conversations with uh, Craig Camp over at Cornerstone, and he's very much um, into making sure that you understand wine is food, and wine is meant to be enjoyed slowly with food. Um, and I got to tell you, my plan going into this is that in a little bit, I am going to stop this and I'm actually going to get some food because I think that, especially when we talk about the acidity on this wine, it's begging for food. This isn't a wine that you could not drink on its own. You definitely could. But I think when you pair it with the right foods, it's definitely going to uh, elevate your entire experience. And that goes with this big boy, and, and again, when I'm thinking of this Napa cab right here, it definitely is a, a big boy cab. It's not an over the top, in your face, super fruit bomb, right? But that fruit is present, that high alcohol is, by the way, uh, again, 14.5, 14.7, the high alcohol is there, it's not in your face. It's very much taking that backseat and these are both very much balanced wines. When I think back to this Howe Mountain here, and let me take another sip. Yeah, I mean, you're not really sensing that alcohol. Um, there is a liveliness to the palate that's coming from the acidity, and I would imagine that there's a, a little bit of that 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 is being that that bouncy type of play is kind of being spiked up by some of that alcohol, but very much a, a nice balanced reserved approach. And it's weird to say reserved when we're talking about 14.7% alcohol in this wine. Um, but it very much is like a, a laid back kind of play. Um, you know, if this wine, I already said, you know, soft, powdery, elegant. Um, this is the one that, uh, it's, it's a thinking man's wine. It's a geeky type of wine. It's a, hear that wine geek? It's a geeky type of wine where you really just want to sit back and, and just continue to let more of these, these, these flavors just kind of come out. So score-wise right now, I'm going to give you some scores along the way for different reasons here. Score-wise right now, a 
and there's like some uh, like strawberry strawberry uh, compote um, that's on here that's very nice. Score wise, I'm gonna give this Howl Mountain. I'm gonna give it a a 91 plus, and I'm gonna give the Napa Valley. Which, by the way, fantastic wine. I'm going to give this Napa Valley a 91. So the Howl Mountain, just edging things out right now. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, take a little break. I want you guys to think about what types of foods you would imagine go really well with either of these wines. Uh, and I'm going to be back in about an hour, and, and one of the reasons why I'm gonna give it about an hour, and of course for you guys it's gonna be like that quick. Um, one of the reasons why I'm giving it so much time is because I just opened these bottles. And so I did wanna talk a little bit about how these wines can change in the glass over an hour, plus it's gonna take me a little bit of time to get this uh, food ready for y'all. And so I hope you enjoy it. I'm gonna put you guys on pause. Maybe you can press pause. You can get some food, you can get some wine, and we'll talk about how they pair together, all right? I'll be back in a moment. So it's been about 40 minutes since I ended the beginning of this show, um, but it's been an hour since I started uh, the show. So, so it's been significant time, and, and here I am. I, I went and I got some food, and I uh, filled the glasses up just a little bit more, um, so I did have just more wine to go back and taste. So this wine has been sitting out for, for over an hour now, and what I wanted to do was go back into the Cornerstone 2010 Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon uh, on my left, your right, uh, and then also the Cornerstone 2010 Howe Mountain Cabernet Sauvignon on my right, your left, over there, Howe Mountain, right? You got it? Good. Okay. And I do have some food, but I'll get into that in just a little bit. I wanted to talk to you for a little bit about how wine can evolve in a glass. You know, it's weird as, as a biology teacher, um, sometimes I get really mad uh, when people use the word evolve or evolution in the wrong way. Um, but I'm going to use it in the wrong way. Just talking about uh, the sense that this wine is changing. No, it's not a, a brand new species or anything like that. And we're not talking about millions or billions of years of change. <clears throat> But what stays constant is that when you're dealing with a life form, such as yeast or such as bacteria, um, that feeds on, on stuff, and when, and when you deal with, gosh, well, bacteria, they do reproduce to the tune of, you know, a new generation every 20 minutes, um, you know, you are dealing with stuff that's going to change as that bacteria and as that yeast feeds on that food. But it's been a while for that. You know, the wine has changed since it's been opened, since it's been uh, oxygenated. And so I want to talk about how those flavors are different. Remember, we were talking about big, dark, fruit-forward wine, and we were talking about um, herbal acidity over here with that Howl Mountain. Let's see how things are changing, because usually what I find is that um, any presence of oak, any overwhelming presence of fruit, usually tends to drop out um, over the course of about an hour. It's still going to be there, but those herbal notes are going to kind of rise up. So let's see what's happening here. In the Napa Valley first, and that's what I'm getting, you know, those, those um, dark fruits are transitioning to some brighter red type of fruits on the nose, um, but really more than anything else, those herbal characteristics are starting to come to the forefront, right? Getting that menthol, I'm getting that chalkiness, Jeremy, that chalkiness uh, is there. Those nice dark pl uh, plums, but really I, I, I think what's happening is those secondary notes that we were noticing before are becoming primary. And those primary uh, fruit tones 
are starting to just back up a little bit. They're starting to become those, those, those cleanup hitters that we were talking about earlier. Let's try it on the palette here. So while the fruit component has stepped back a little bit, it's still definitely there. Again, what I'm noticing is those darker fruits have yielded themselves um, to the brighter red fruits. Um, I'm getting a lot more of that brambliness, that, um, that blackberry and that raspberry type of fruit coming forward. And while the plumminess is still there and the cassis notes are still there, it's really more of those red fruits that are coming forward um, on this wine. Those herbal notes dancing around, you're starting to notice where the acidity was very much at the forefront of the Howl Mountain. With the Napa Valley, the acidity is starting to make itself known. Um, and I think the wine itself while still, and when I say big, I'm saying relatively big, uh, this Napa Valley compared to this Howe Mountain over here. While relatively big, um, you know, it's definitely um, become a little bit more reserved, a little bit more smooth than it was earlier on, right? Um, really nice. I'm liking the way this one is changing here. It's becoming something that was kind of my style to something that has become definitely my style over the course of that hour, right? Now, <clears throat> with the Howl Mountain, on the nose, I'm still getting that tobacco. I'm still getting that black tea. I am getting a little bit of a stronger presence of those red fruits. I am getting that I was, I was mentioning strawberry compote before, right? I, I think I was talking about it being on this one, but more on the palate, right? So I'm noticing it more on the nose there. I am getting this strawberry characteristic. I'm getting some floral notes that are starting to come through on a red wine. It's something that we don't often look for, but it's definitely there. So almost like some... Um, some fresh cut red roses are inside of there. So that's kind of nice, kind of interesting, kind of different. And and really, you know, earlier when I was saying 90 and then, or 91 and then 91 plus, um, really I think the, the thing that, that I was liking a lot about this Howl Mountain right here is that um, it's one that you can think about a little bit more. I mean, when's the last time you had fresh cut red roses on the nose of your wine, right? So I, I think that's what makes it kind of fun and that's what kind of puts it over the top right there. Now on the palate, You know, the toastiness of that new French oak is actually becoming a little bit more apparent on the Howl Mountain right now. Um, wow. So yeah, I'm definitely getting like a woodsy uh, type of quality. I'm, I'm getting a little bit of that vanilla that we were noticing before. Um, still getting that black pepper. It's still kind of spicy. Um, and it's definitely a different type of cab. Um, what I would say, you know, not knowing each and every one of you, but but so proud uh, to know a lot of you guys out there. Um, what I would say is this Napa Valley Cabernet right here is definitely a wine for the masses. I think the vast majority of you are really going to think that your $65 was well spent. For this one. I mean, you're getting something that is smooth, something that is elegant, something that's having these really nice big fruits, but they're not overpowering and still having those good secondary and tertiary, tertiary like herbal type of notes. This one is definitely um, very much so herbal all the way. Um, it's spicy. It's a little bit
Yeah, I mean, almost a little bit smoky. The tannins are a bit more aggressive here. Um, but, I mean, that speaks to ageability, right? I mean, when we talk about these cornerstone uh, Cabernets, what I find is that there is this nice balance of approachability and ageability. These are definitely wines that um, could could definitely do better with age in the bottle and definitely do better with age in the glass. Um, I'm not going to change my scores on these. I, I felt like my scores were right about um, good, but but these are really... Um, these are really solid wines that uh, can stick around for a while, but are very much enjoyable right now. If I were you, um, I'd hold on the, to these guys for at least the next five years. I think um, definitely both of these wines would be great in 10 years. I know a lot of you don't want to wait that long, um, but I think 10 years down the road, these are going to be fantastic. And I think in a way... I almost think the Napa Valley one uh, lends itself to more of an ageability just because it is so big and so in your in your face right now. It's definitely got the structure to hold what's happening to it right now. I think what you're going to notice with the Hal Mountain is that it's definitely going to be one of these wines where, um, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, it's going to be all herbal. Right, um, and and you're gonna get a lot of like vegetal characteristics, which I really like a whole lot. Um, if you are well experienced with having uh, eight wines with some age on it, and I'm talking about ten plus uh, years of age, uh, this is definitely gonna be more up your alley. I think the vast majority of you, and including myself. Um, are really going to like this one for a long time. I'm still giving this one the 91 plus, and I'm giving the Napa Valley the 90 uh, one, but uh, just really nice. Now, and again, I'm taking my time with these wines, and so, you know, maybe you want to take a break because I'm about to get into the food right now, um, or maybe you just want to power through. Um, what did you guys think I was going to pair with it? I know I kind of flashed it up real quick. Um, here's what I was thinking, and part of it has to do with locality for me. Um, recently, if you've been following this blog for a while, you've noticed the last um, few episodes that I've done, and they have been a lot more sporadic over the last couple of months, have been in some new confines. Kara and I... Um, within the last two months, um, have moved to a, a new house in Gilroy, California, the garlic capital of the world. Um, and you know, from Morgan Hill, it's really not that far. It's, it's, it's 10 minutes, right? It's, it's pretty close for us. Um, and so what I thought I'd do was I would show you something, you know, in the last few months that we've been here, this has become my favorite, um, Wow. My favorite way to really treat myself in a local Gilroyan type of way, um, there's this burger place called Cafe 152 Burger. Now, Highway 152 stretches from Santa Cruz, I'm sorry, from Watsonville in Santa Cruz County, over and through the Santa Cruz Mountains, down through Gilroy in the Santa Clara Valley, and then goes over, uh, uh, and they call that Hecker Pass, it goes over Pacheco Pass over to Five, which runs the stretch of California. So if I were going to go to uh, Los Angeles, I would, I would go over Pacheco Pass on 152 and uh, head down the Five towards L.A., although I don't know why you'd ever want to go to L.A. ever. Um, but there you go. Cafe 152 Burger, they do uh, certified Angus beef. They have these amazing toppings and amazing house-made ketchup and chipotle ketchup. Um, and this, what I got right here, is called the Big Roy. And it really does signify what Gilroy is all about. 100% Angus beef burger with roasted garlic inside. And if you aren't into roasted garlic... You gots to get in. Um, it's really easy to, to put together, honestly. Just get like a full bulb of garlic, put some really good olive oil over the top, put it on a cookie sheet, put it in your oven at 
like 350 and and check back on it in in like half an hour an hour and you're just going to get this creamy nutty awesomeness and it's going to make you smell but you're going to get used to that smell and it's going to be fantastic so this is the big roy right there it's got that roasted garlic in it it's got bacon i got some pepper jack cheese on there there's some garlic aioli and only the freshest of the fresh ingredients oh man I love this bad boy. So I guess what I'm gonna do is this. Let me go Napa Valley. With its big fruit and its minerality. And dare I say the acidity is really coming through. Um, and I don't know why I said minerality. I meant herbaceousness. Although there is a good minerality there as well. And let me take a bite. This could possibly become the longest episode of Stay Rad Wine Blog TV of all time, but that's all right. The richness and the juiciness of the burger paired so nicely with the um, sinful smokiness of the bacon and the nutty creaminess of the roasted garlic and the aioli and that snap of the fresh lettuce and the tomatoes. Um, so good, so good. Now with the wine, what I'm finding is the um, herbal notes are kind of congealing with the nutty creaminess of the garlic there and um, I'm really just getting an overall juiciness um, from this burger a really nice really awesome pairing and look when you talk about a $65 wine and a burger uh, a lot of people are gonna scoff at that I think this is fantastic right now uh, dare we go $80 wine when we talk about this how mountain I say, yeah. Those spicy, peppery, and herbal notes are just on the forefront already. Let me take uh, another bite of the big Roy here. It stands for Gilroy. Uh, and then we'll see what's happening. That rocking, long, lingering acidity, that dancing on the palate I was talking about earlier with those herbaceous notes and that high level of alcohol um, has really worked wonders. You know, what it's doing is it's kind of um, cutting through that fat, right? And a lot of times when we talk about acidity in our wine, it really does a good job of just chopping up those that fattiness, right? And bringing up the secondary notes of the meat, which a lot of times we miss out on. Um, I'm just getting this like rock solid, awesome, beefy flavor. I'm not noticing the garlic as much, which to some of you guys might be a good thing. I'm a little bummed out about that, but I think there's still these just beautiful, beefy notes. I mean, it's really tasty. Right? You think I'm stopping? I'm just getting started, right? We're getting back into uh, these french fries right here. And I've got regular ketchup. I got chipotle ketchup. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you about like which one I would pair with which. Um, I think when we talk about the regular ketchup, um, it's big and bold and it's tomatoey. 
And I think that the um, if we're talking about things that are similar, I think a lot of us would think that we would do the regular ketchup with the um, big Napa Valley Cabernet. I like to look at juxtapositions, right? We've got this chipotle ketchup, which has some spice, which has some smoke, right? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to go chipotle ketchup with the big juicy Napa Valley, and then I'm going to get the big juicy regular ketchup with the spicy and smoky Howl Mountain, right? Sound good, right? So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, chipotle ketchup with the french fry. And Chipotle, it's just um, fire roasted jalapenos, right? Really good spice, really good smokiness, really good salt and fattiness uh, on that french fry. And then with the Napa Valley Cabernet, It really livens up those herbaceous notes that we were waiting for. I mean, we've spent well over an hour just waiting on that fruit to drop back and waiting on those herbal notes to really come to the forefront. And that's exactly what's happening now. It took chipotle ketchup to really make this happen. Um, and really, it just took time, right? And I think that's the big thing. We don't spend enough time with our wines, um, you know, I don't spend enough time on these videos. I know for a lot of you guys, it's kind of a marathon at this point. For me, um, it's an exploration into the philosophy of what I'm really doing here, right? Um, wow, that's really tasty. I mean, if we were just going Chipotle ketchup, French fries, and then these big, this big Napa Valley 2010 Cornerstone Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, that's a ridiculously awesome pairing right now, right? So let's try it with the Howl Mountain. French fry, regular ketchup. And there's something to be said about artisan ketchups. Why aren't more places doing that? If I had a burger joint, or if I had just a, a restaurant in general, I don't see why I would. I mean, really fantastic ketchup, right? And then with the Howl Mountain, there's this juiciness, there's this plumminess that's coming up in that Howl Mountain Cabernet. And I mean, just as I was starting to think that the Napa Valley was going to really win this battle. And I, again, I mean, at $65, this really is a value. I mean, I would put it up against so many Napa Valley Cabernets um, that are asking for $50, $60, $70 that don't bring this type of balance, this type of fruit, this type of acidity, this type of herbaceousness, um, this type of approachability at such a young age, but also longevity. Um, I put it against them all. Um, but with that being said, as much as I was starting to really gravitate towards this one, you know, the thing that really puts that Hell Mountain over the top, for me, there's something about a site-specific wine. There's something about... Um, a wine that does or is not afraid to rock the herbaceousness and the acidity. And as a Cabernet, you know, a lot of times folks are expecting to be blown away on that very first sip. Um, this is a wine with the guts, with the wherewithal, with the chutzpah, with the ganas um, to really... Really, just say, you know what, relax, take your time, and you're going to see why this is the winner. And it definitely is. Um, those big fruit notes that some of us would, would think are kind of lacking in the Howl Mountain um, are very much expressed um, with a simple pairing of french fries and ketchup. I mean, all of a sudden, this wine 
becomes that monster that you were expecting it to be. It becomes the um, the uh, the the mountain creature um, that you're searching for. The searching for Bigfoot guys. Um, I mean, really, this is what they're searching for. This is a fantastic wine. Uh, I love them both. You know, uh, I feel like I could keep going for hours. But I also feel like, you know, now's the time for me to really, I mean, look at this gigantic plate of food I have. It's time for me to really dig into it. Um, I, I, I do want to take a moment. And so here's probably another five minutes right here. Uh, I do want to take a moment to just say, you know, I'm so happy. You know, I started this wine blog in the spring of 2011, and here we are in the winter of 2013. We're almost in 2014, and it's really just been something that um, uh, has been so fun for me, and just kind of like a, a random, different kind of hobby. Um, it's a way for me to... Uh, here I am just like trying to search for words and I can't come up with it. It's a way for me to um, talk about things that I normally don't talk about with uh, folks in my everyday life. And I feel like in a sense, um, if you are a, an avid watcher of this show, I've probably shared things with you that I don't normally share to the average person that I talk to face to face. Um, and it really, uh, I'm so happy that we've built like this sense of uh, community here with um, the folks that do keep coming back and keep commenting and sending emails. And, and I'm just so happy. I'm at this weird kind of different place in my life where if, if, if everything goes according to plan in two days, I'm going to have a, a son, a baby boy. And um, it, it was never my intention to, have this be something that I'm sharing with everybody and yet yet here I am and I feel okay with that and I feel very comfortable with that um I'm just so happy that we we've, we've spent all this time together and I I definitely know that you know I'm taking some time off of work to be with my kid um but this show to me it's not work right? This is so much fun for me. And I've, I, I enjoy putting these things out so much for you. And, um, I want to try to try to do more of that for you. I've been kind of taking a rest at this stuff, um, for the last like four months. I haven't been pumping out as much content as I normally would, but I feel like 2014 is going to be the year and, and who knows things could change. Uh, in two days when all of a sudden I'm a father, right? Uh, but things could definitely change. But as I see it now, I really want 2014 to be the year where more of us are uh, sharing wine, more of us are sharing stories, more of us are, are, are having fun exploring the things that, that make us who we are. And now I'm just rambling. But I, I just wanted to say that I appreciate you guys so much. And, and please leave a comment. Let me know what you thought about this ridiculously elongated episode. Let me know if you are experienced with um, Cornerstone wines or Napa wines or Howe Mountain wines. How you feel about those type of wines and where they are and where they're going. How do you feel about food and wine? What do you want to see from Stay Rad Wine Blog TV? in 2014. Leave a comment. Let me know. Till next time, everybody. Stay rad.